Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our gospel lesson today is from Luke 15, as we heard, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, Jesus has been teaching and preaching publicly, and he's really starting by this point in Luke's gospel to show up on the public's radar. In fact, many tax collectors, Gentiles, and sinners want to hear more. Jesus spends time with them, including sharing meals with them. However, the Pharisees and scribes in Jesus' day taught that eating with sinners or Gentiles was wrong. It wasn't just that the Pharisees didn't like this. No, they also taught people that eating with sinners and Gentiles was offensive to God, incurring his punishment and wrath. And so Jesus tells uh, three parables. Our gospel lesson skipped ahead to the last parable, but there's two other ones in between that. And all three parables are about things that have been lost and found. Jesus is aiming to teach us what God's attitude towards a fallen world is. The three parables encourage us to rejoice when God's kingdom comes. He invites us to join in the party over finding what was lost. Uh, first, Jesus tells the parable of the 100 sheep and their shepherd. When one is lost, the shepherd actively seeks to find it and restore it to the flock. I mean, if you lose something valuable, you try to find it, right? Well, Jesus ends this story by saying, just so. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In other words, those who are lost are valuable to the good shepherd. The second parable is uh, about a woman who loses a tenth of her money, and maybe it helps to think of this might be like a tenth of her retirement income. So she, she searches until she finds it, but she doesn't just search half-heartedly. Sometimes I'll look for something, or maybe the kids will, and my wife will ask if we really looked for it before she comes to our rescue. And you see, you're, you're not really looking for things if you just walk into a room and then walk out. You've got to turn the lights on. Uh, you've got to get on your, uh, pick things up, get on your hands and knees to look under the furniture. Well, it wasn't easy for this woman to find her lost coin, but when she did, she rejoiced. She throws a party and invites over her friends. The, the last parable, ours for today, is considerably richer in details and nuance. However, there is one glaring omission. When the shepherd finds his sheep, everyone rejoices. When the woman finds her missing coin, she likewise rejoices and invites others to join in her rejoicing. Yet when the prodigal son returns home, which the son is certainly more important than silver or sheep, the elder brother does not rejoice. He grumbles. When the missing son is no longer missing, what is missing? Rejoicing. The parable begins with a wealthy man and two sons. One of them comes to the father and asks for his inheritance. Now, I can't really imagine going up to my father and saying, Dad, give me what's coming to me. I want it now. You know, I was hoping I'd have had it by now, but you're still here. I mean, this son is basically saying, you're worth more to me dead than alive. I want my inheritance. And shockingly, the father actually gives it to him. And the son quickly goes off to a foreign country because, I mean, after all, who in that town would want to have anything to do with this son uh, because they'd be appalled at his total lack of respect and this good-for-nothing goes off and spends all his money and is left punished penniless. He ends up in a humiliating job, feeding unclean pigs before he finally comes to his senses. When the prodigal is without hope, he returns to his father. Uh, my father's servants are in far better shape than I am. Perhaps he'll take me back as a worker if I apologize enough. But before he even gets through his whole spiel, his father has run out to meet him, puts him in a bear hug, presumably, and is giddy with excitement. He says, 
basically get him his suit and his tie, start up the, the barbecue and the smoker. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And that's a, some serious love right there. And a son had wished that his father was as good as dead. He had taken inheritance that he hadn't earned, and he'd squandered it. But the father, we're told, was watching for the son, and he rejoiced that his son was alive and back home. But big bro is not happy. When he hears it's a party for his naughty little brother, he wants no part of it. Why don't you throw me a party, Dad? Why are we celebrating this low life? But the father responds, I, I always take care of you, and all that I have I share with you. But your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. The, um, other, the, uh, this other brother would apparently rather not see his brother reconciled and safe. He wants his brother to pay for his betrayal. He wants to see justice. He wants punishment. And this forgiveness of a massive debt offends him. Now, maybe he thinks he's defending the father's honor. But if so, the, other, the, the older son is clearly misguided, and he's ignoring what his father is saying and doing. Um, the father wants the son to rejoice that his, brother is lo his lost brother is safe and sound. Back in the fold, it's obvious what the father wants, because he's killing the fattened calf and, and making it publicly known he has accepted back his prodigal son with open arms. He's announcing to the servants, uh, the other son, and the whole community twice saying, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Uh, do we want uh, to see our enemies fail like this older brother? Do we want to see our brothers and sisters fail so that we can look better? Do we like it when the person that we mocked or didn't get along with gets in trouble and develops an addiction? Do we like to see our opponents fall on their face? Do we relish their pain and rejection? Oftentimes, we do like to see people fail. We want our assumptions about people to be proved right so we can smugly reassure ourselves, see, I was right about them all along. They got what they had coming, and it doesn't bother me in the least. Serves them right. But how do we respond to God's grace? Are we offended when someone gets more than we think they deserve? Are we offended when someone is forgiven? Do we prefer revenge to grace? At least this prodigal son recognized his sin. He sunk down, but he came to his senses, and the father restored him. In fact, he rejoiced over his return. He's clearly been restored to the father. He's once again part of the estate. In fact, he's a beloved child. Yet the older son seems to prefer rejoicing over bitterness. He prefers to feel personally wounded and nurses that grudge instead of rejoicing. Which will it be for you? Rejoicing or bitterness? Uh, unfortunately, it seems to become more acceptable to insult, ridicule, and demonize anybody who's inconveniently in our way. Um, bitterness is all the rage right now. I'm, I'm sure you have reasons, probably some legitimate ones, why you might choose to be bitter over this or that, or perhaps even over a brother or sister in Christ who is getting more than they deserve. But Jesus encourages you instead to rejoice because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been forgiven, called to love one another and to rejoice over God's grace. And rejoicing with the Father is the best cure to this sort of bitterness. Don't, don't think that staying bitter over sin is godly. God wants to rejoice. He wants you to rejoice with forgiven sinners and with him. The angels are rejoicing over one sinner who repents, so why not join in? Rejoice that our Father who is waiting to restore and revive has won yet again. Celebrate that hell has another vacancy and heaven another citizen. Because Christians, 
we are, Christians are called to cheer, not to jeer. We should root for one another and not against each other. We were all dead in sin, but now we are all alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. And after all, why turn down a great excuse to party? Rejoice, because you have been shown incomparable grace, and others well, others have as well. Don't jeer, cheer. We rejoice in God's grace. In Jesus' name, amen.